There we go. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2020 NASC uh, presidential lecture. Uh, my name is Tai Feng Qian. Uh, I'm the chair of NASC and also chair of this, uh, uh, this lecture. Uh, today, I'm very uh, uh, pleased to introduce the NASC president and the speaker today, uh, Dr. Kara Kalkman. Uh, Dr. Kalkman is a uh, Dewitt Green Greer Centennial Professor for Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, her primary research interests include planning for shared and autonomous vehicle systems, the statistical model, modeling of urban systems, energy and climate issues, the economic impacts of transportation policy, and a crash occurrence and consequence, consequences. Uh, she has authored over 170 journal articles. Uh, Dr. Kalkman is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, the Google Research Award, MIT Technology Reward, a Reveal Top 100 uh, Innovators uh, Award, and several uh, awards from the American Society of Civil Engineers. And, uh, and uh, most recently, uh, she was listed in the top 20 in 2020 influential women in mobility by the uh, Influential Women in Mobility Products. And I checked that list. It was really a fantastic list of uh, uh, academic and business leaders. Um, a registered uh, professional uh, engineer, she holds a PhD, MS, and BS in uh, civil engineering, a master's uh, in, civil, uh, in city planning, and a minor's in economics uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, I think in the past four years, uh, our president have uh, have been in the area for regional uh, economics. And this year, apparently we have a different direction. And uh, I do believe transportation is, uh, is a very important part of uh, regional science. So it's uh, really glad to have you, Kara, to talk about uh, a topic, your research on uh, autonomous vehicles. And the official title of your talk is um, uh, Self-Driving and All Electric anticipating the travel, trade, and energy impacts of autonomous trucks and cars for US markets. Um, before uh, Dr. Kalkman starts, just a few words about um, housekeeping issues. Um, I think you will, uh, Dr. Kalkman will speak about for one hour also, and then we have a, a Q&A session. And um, I'm hoping to make this, um, this lecture more interactive. So. We prefer if you can ask uh, uh, your questions by voice, you can raise your hands and we will allow you to talk. Uh, this is a webinar session, so uh, we cannot, you know, you cannot directly talk, but if you raise your hand, you will be able to do so. And, but also if you prefer just uh, ask questions um, through a Q and A box or chat box, uh, that's fine with us too. Um, without further ado, um, Tara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. This is such an honor you, Guys, I, I'm just delighted. Um, we've got a new colleague here in our information systems uh, college, and he was the chair of, of the council last year, so he thought of me perhaps as president. I've chaired the council before, but it's been about 10 years, so so nice to, to be in this special role and be able to talk to you all about the research that my students do here. For about 10 years now, we started with a fellow named Dan Fagnant, he now works with General Motors, uh, so he tried academia, but he was in Salt Lake City where the air quality gets pretty bad, and so his spouse was hoping he might come back to Austin, and sure enough, he's here, and um, since Dan Fagnan started, uh, kicked it off for us, really, with all this shared autonomous vehicle work, we've become real experts, so many of my students uh, work in this area. I have one online today, in fact. Uh, Murthy Gudomurthy is in the attendees box I was noticing and so he's a, a primary author of so much of this work and a great mentor to a lot of the students who are here at UT with me. Uh, but whilst we're talking about electric vehicles and, and we'll be talking about energy and emissions a little bit and uh, so I've got five different parts to this presentation. Yan Tao Huang who was at this meeting, this RSAI meeting last year helped I mean, pull this all together. And, and those of you who were watching the GSSI seminar a month or two ago that our Italian colleagues put on to um, keep research going, not let research stop, uh, we'll, we'll be familiar with some of these slides. So my apologies if anybody was on in that group uh, a couple of months ago. But I see a lot of friends uh, online with us today, um, Brigetta and both David. So nice to have David Boyce in the crowd. 
Um, and of course, uh, David Plain and, and Neil Reed, our director, uh, Jeff Hewings. I, I've, I actually have an award with Jeff Hewings name on it. So that's kind of uh, a personal connection as well. Um, but uh, Janet here in Texas with me, she's in the Houston area. Jason Hawkins is up in Toronto and now working with our team. So, so nice of all of you to be part of this. And Mashur is also here. He's doing pedestrian crash modeling with me and he's in our city planning program here at UT. So um, I was just showing you uh, an image of a COVID spread through transportation networks. And of course, networks was the topic that Stefan Goetz last year spoke about as his pre presidential address. So even though those are considered economists, I have minors in economics, uh, both undergrad and graduate. I teach a class in transportation economics, but transportation is, is core uh, to our economy and it's core uh, to you know, our everyday lives. So it's a, it's a really important um, piece of the economic puzzle. Uh, so we'll be talking about a lot of things today. These are just a few of the makes or models of, of vehicles that um, you may have seen on the road. We had uh, several of these Koala cars from uh, Google in here in Austin. And, um, and we, of course, I guess Elon Musk has now got a fabrication plant that's, that's being built here. And his boring company for tunneling um, is also going to open something here in Austin. So it's a pretty hot spot, but of course, Mountain View is is the biggest hot spot, and um, and I, I grew up in Palo Alto, so I'm trying to uh, get the I'm going to get the laser pointer going for you here. So Yan Tao, um, Ken, I, Yahweh, Hanan, Krishna Murthy, uh, a lot of these these people have contributed to these slides, and, and these are all students here. So this five part uh, presentation starts with freight uh, because a lot of you work in uh, freight and trade. And so one of the big questions is autonomous trucks, uh, what they might do to US trade flows because they make it a lot easier for the trucks to travel further. They can still have operators on board that are there for pickups and drop offs. And in case something goes wrong, like a tire blows out or you know you need to fill it with gasoline or, or diesel, I guess in this case, uh, where somebody hits you, <laughs> hopefully the autonomous truck isn't gonna hit other vehicles, but all these sorts of things can happen. And so it's nice to have a, a person on board who can handle maybe administrative tasks, back office tasks while the vehicle is largely driving itself and it sleep. And so that allows for much longer uh, trading and, and less expensive trading. Although the upfront cost of, of purchasing one of these vehicles is very high. So, uh, but the, the driver can sleep, you know, while the vehicle is moving. And so the hours of service rules really change a fair bit. Uh, so we, we start with the best data that we can get, which is the freight analysis framework that comes from the economic census. And they, to protect uh, privacy, do these very coarse zones across the nation. And we have to kind of um, calibrate models that we then distribute to a, a smaller zone system. And so there, there are some aggregation biases in doing that. And of course we aggregate the industries as well. Um, so we're using the commodity flow survey portion of the economic census. Uh, we're using you know the best data that we can find without having to you know interview firms ourselves um, which is always tricky because every firm is pretty distinctive and and careful about the information they would share with you uh, we do use implan to get those technical coefficients that we're going to need in our random utility-based multi-regional input output model and then we've got railway and highway networks uh, but we're not tracking the the pipelines and we're not tracking air and and water here and we do, um, we really enjoy, you know, using travel demand models for the congestion feedbacks because these are really intense networks, especially the highway network or the roadway network is incredibly intense. So, um, you know, millions of links across this nation. So we need fast software that, that loads and unloads that network quickly to allow an iteration towards sort of a, a user equilibrium of shortest paths or cheapest inputs basically for these firms and these businesses. And so we also have the economic sense uh, sectors, you know, so we've got to go across uh, code systems on these, but these are the 13 big sectors. We've also got government and, and labor or households uh, in this market, of course, uh, providing key inputs or, and key demand. <laughs> um, we use a nested logit. So um, the, uh, the manufacturers or the um, industries are purchasing their inputs from different origins and there's 
you know, thousands of counties, so over 3,000 counties that they could be purchasing from with maybe multiple firms in each county. And, and they've got a couple major modes that we're looking at. Again, we're ignoring pipeline and water and air. Those are not major modes uh, for most commodities, but of course, um, gasoline and, and, and natural gas are, are heavily moved by pipeline. And then we have a, a type of truck. So we've got the human driven truck with an H and the autonomous or self-driving truck uh, with an A. And so this is a nested because these two are very similar. They can go door to door, they can go just in time, unlike rail. Um, so these are nested in here with their own inclusive coefficients. Um, and you know, it's a three level random utility maximization model uh, kicked off by Dan McFadden who, who won the Nobel prize for uh, economics in the year 2000. And that was after he kind of supervised uh, my dissertation at Berkeley, even though I was in engineering, uh, he was, I think the most important and therefore de facto supervisor for me, but I was largely on my own. So I, I had an NSF award uh, to get me through grad school. So I was very fortunate. And we built this random utility based uh, multi-regional input output model that some of you may have seen before. Uh, we've been using it for about 14 years now uh, where we, we bring together inputs using those implant coefficients at the county level and we, we use them to uh, serve export demands as well as you know, in, um, upstream inputs to other firms across the nation. And we have that logit model for that nested logit model for the types of, of modes and destinations or excuse me, origin choices in this case. And then there's this sort of equal, equilibration of the prices because the cost of that travel, um, it gets, gets added to each of these inputs. And so most people would prefer to purchase their inputs uh, closer and maybe by truck if truck is cheaper, but certainly faster in lots of ways than rail. And so those prices get embedded in the system and it equilibrates across this. Uh, so there's a feedback here. And um, I just wanna give you a sense of the outputs. So this is the kind of work you can do uh, and with this kind of model, which is I think, yeah, provided freely. It's a non-proprietary software at my website along with lots of uh, documentation uh, to help your students use this. And so we, we take a look at before we added the autonomous trucks to the system, um, most of you know, the, the value of our shipments is carried by truck versus rail. And these are the distance, uh, I guess, components for these are the, the distance bands. And then the ton miles, you know, truck um, is, is not as competitive for some of those longer distances uh, for the heavier goods. So this is ton miles uh, where you see rail uh, often dominating for the longer distances. And of course that's as expected, um, but once we add the autonomous trucks, um, we do see big shifts. And, and these are just a, a, a couple uh, pairs of images that Yan Tao thought would make you know, the most sense to share with you. The blue lines are the reductions actually in some of these domestic flows and the red lines are the increases. Um, so there were a fair amount of reductions in those domestic flows. Um, these are all, I think, scaled the same way. Well, no, actually these are, this is a different scale down here. Uh, these are the exports. So these are the final um, departures from this continental US uh, zone system. Um, and, and there's a fair amount of red. So there, there are increases in some of that export. We're not modeling the whole world. So we're not really taking a look at whether um, other countries feel our A truck uh, system is, is, is cheaper and better for them. And we're keeping the export demands fixed. Um, but the, the trucking uh, definitely goes up with these red uh, lines here you can see. So truck flows in millions of dollars, big increases, especially across the nation. So all of these are, these are the biggest flow uh, changes that we can show you here. Not a lot of losses for trucking, but definitely down here, a lot of blue for the losses in rail. And, and, and that's of course what we were expecting. Although it's really interesting, the pairs of markets, right? And if you look at, here's um, New Mexico with you know, big, big reductions. Um, and, and these are all aggregated, even though we were modeling at the county level, these images have been aggregated to um, the, the NUMAs. Uh, so there's only about 400 of those to show you, uh, or the FAF zone systems, I should say. Uh, we can zoom in at some of the cities. Um, so these are the, the major cities in a lot of uh, those counties. And so 
Uh, these are some of the biggest, most impacted or, or largest cities and, and most populated. And you can see whether they uh, will experience more trucking flow or less. Okay, so a lot of blue still in here for Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. These are all, of course, Texas cities. Austin, sort of a zero impact on the outbound flows, um, a reduction on the inbound. So they're skipping over Texas, it looks like, um, with these kinds of assumptions in this background model. Uh, whereas uh, Minneapolis and, and Kansas City are, are seeing actually increases. They're not being skipped over, which is interesting. And we would never be able to guess this um, without these, these complex systems models. And not that this is necessarily what will happen, but it, it gives you a sense of how it could shake out. Um, so most cities see, you know, rising truck flows, both inbound and outbound. Uh, but a lot of the Texas cities and, and even Miami, Detroit, Salt Lake City seeing some decreases. Um, all cities seeing lower, you know, reduced rail as expected. And um, San Jose, California, Washington, D.C. seeing big reduction. So those are both, of course, on the coast. Uh, but in general, California, it seems to do have a lot of increase in, in, in flows of one kind or another uh, through the trucking. And overall, in case you're wondering, like, how much more, uh, how many more trucks you're going to see uh, um, doing those, those longer route uh, inter-county trades, we're guessing about 11 percent but rail falling about five percent and um you know rail remains competitive uh, for many commodities over 3,000 miles which is pretty much across the nation uh the human driven trucks are still being chosen especially for the shorter distance movements so they've been kind of aggregated in, in some of those images with the autonomous trucks um so they're not out of the picture completely they, uh, it doesn't make sense, uh, depending on your cost assumption, to purchase that that autonomous truck in, in some markets where you really need the driver anyway. So uh, you don't need to automate that vehicle in the short term. But on the longer distances, it really keeps that asset moving and in full use. So, so over 500 miles, you're seeing the autonomous trucks dominating. And most of the sectors show an increase in trucking. Um, there were 13 of those commodity-based sectors. and you know, almost all of them showing an increase. So interesting, interesting for us to take a, a look at that. Very few people do this kind of modeling. So I'm really lucky that Yan Tao knows how to do this well. Um, and yeah, the automation is lowering overall shipping costs. So we, we might, you know, expect more demand for our goods if we automate before other nations do and, and our total ton miles rising slightly because of the, the ease of which we can move things across the nation and longer distances. Uh, we can also scale down and look at something smaller than the nation. This is called the mega region. This is the Texas Triangle. And we're looking now not just at freight movements, um, but also uh, personal trips, which of course are the majority of, of vehicles that you see out there or the majority of, of, of value moved is, is humans uh, being moved in addition to the freight. Um, so of course, this is part of Texas. It's from uh, Houston to San Antonio through Austin all the way up to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And I guess along the way, you've got maybe Waco and Round Rock in there. So you're seeing the I-35 corridor here. I guess this is the I-10 corridor. Um, and yeah, really important uh, you know, situation for us because these autonomous vehicles and trucks make driving much easier. So you can imagine a lot more driving. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of traffic analysis zones in this mega region. So almost half of the state's traffic analysis zones. Um, and 60 of the largest uh, counties and most, or 66 of the most populated counties. Uh, lots of uh, nodes and links to keep track of, not nearly as many as we had in the national uh, model I was just showing you, but still quite a lot. And so that's why we do often uh, turn to that, that special software for loading the large networks. And um, we then extract, so we, we actually model the bigger region. So there's no halo or boundary effect. We model the bigger region and then we pull out the mega region results for you. And part of the reason we did this is just because the money that we were getting uh, was through a university transportation center that's focused on mega regions. Um, and we used, you know, kind of a standard aggregate travel demand model here rather than microscopic, which is what we do when we simulate shared autonomous vehicles, which are basically individual agents that, that move just like a, a Lyft vehicle or an Uber vehicle would move from person to person. We'll, we'll micro simulate that within um, a city or a region. But for these larger regions, uh, we usually go with more of an aggregate travel demand model. 
And um, of course the base case, so business as usual is without the autonomous vehicles. And it's not just personally owned autonomous vehicles, but shared autonomous vehicles, which is what Uber and Lyft and Waymo are, and um, you know, most um, manufacturers are thinking of is to uh, share these assets so that they get better use of that, that high cost automation, but also they have us more control over the vehicle. So it's like an autonomous taxi. And then we have the autonomous truck. And then we do sensitivity analysis, of course, because we know none of our assumptions is perfect. And so uh, the value of time reductions that you can get by not having to drive. So hands-free travel for the driver, um, you know, might be a reduction of 50% or maybe just 25%, these kinds of things. And of course, the price of automation is going to fall over time. And so that's kind of the, 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 the long-term travel demand model that people would use for most of our metropolitan uh, modeling in this country and elsewhere. Um, and we do just one day um, with peak times a day and that kind of thing. Um, so, but it's not microscopic in time either. And we have to make assumptions about what the operating cost of a human driven vehicle is uh, versus an autonomous vehicle uh, versus a shared autonomous vehicle. And so these were some of the assumptions Yan Tao was making, um, this may seem kind of high, right? The marginal cost of driving a car you already own is much lower than 60 cents per mile. And then of course, if you automate that vehicle, um, you will probably pay more up front, uh, but you will enjoy some real significant value of travel time savings because you can sleep, you can read, uh, you can do all sorts of things inside that vehicle, I, I suppose. Um, but we're, we're looking not just at long distance, but of course, short distance trips, and we're also looking at air travel. And so that is, is for passengers in this case, and that is greatly affected by the ease of being able to go hundreds of miles uh, while you know not having to worry about passing through airline security and all this kind of thing. Uh, bus and rail trips, uh, both for passengers and freight are, are expected to fall here. And, and these are kind of, um, how the difference in, in thousands of trips per day uh, from, from some of this, this addition of this um, new mode. And so um, we're seeing reductions in bus and rail and then automobile because of the, it's an autonomous automobile in many cases, not all cases, you still have the human driven vehicle, uh, we're seeing a big jump. And here's air uh, for this mega region, there's only, you know, the major markets would be Austin and San Antonio to Dallas, Fort Worth or to Houston. And of course, Houston to Dallas is a major market too. So all those distances are right in here at about 140 miles. And so that's why you're seeing that big reduction in the air travel there versus a zero. Okay, so um, nobody's gonna fly from Austin to San Antonio, I don't think. That's just an hour and a half drive. Um, we can look at the freight, you know, by truck versus rail versus an intermodal shipment. We can look at the different industries. So coal sees a big jump um, on the truck side of things. The non-metallic minerals looks really high, but as a percentage term, it's not that big, I guess. Chemicals, petroleum, clay. So you can you can dive in, which most travel man modelers don't do. But luckily, I have that economics and that regional science background that keeps me working in these areas with my students. Um, you can look at trip distance that kind of histograms, let's say, or density functions for these things. And because of where the major cities are, you can get bumps in, in some of these in terms of trips per day. Um, and these are, we have long distance trips, we have the short distance trips. Uh, so we're, we're looking at before and after on trucks versus um, passenger travel. So lots of information in, in these pieces of work by my students. And of course, we have these original assumptions um, the average trip distance uh, before uh, autonomous vehicles was about 14 miles for all these different trip types across this very large region. And it, it went up by, um, I guess, more than 10%. It went up by about 15% um, after the autonomous vehicles were introduced. And then, of course, truck trips might have also increased within the region. Um, the freight spatial patterns, we've got similar kinds of spider images for the, this triangle, this Texas triangle um, increases and decreases and uh, before the autonomous vehicles and after the autonomous vehicles. And uh, yeah, about a 9% trip increase for um, trucking activity within the region with itself. Um, so not even though we've got the big network and we've got, um, we're using the statewide um, traffic analysis zone system and system when we zoom in for this particular set of counties, 66 counties, 
um, we have these these kinds of images for the different sectors. These are six sectors that Yantao picked out, and so um, a lot of increases on the trucking side for for these particular six, um, especially between the Dallas Fort Worth metroplex and the Houston area, but also San Antonio. Austin is not a big uh, manufacturer, as many of you know. We're we're more known for our universities and our state government and our high tech sectors. Um, vehicle miles traveled, which is what VMT stands for, rising across the region um, uh, substantially in many cases. So vehicle miles traveled rising dramatically, rail falling dramatically, but rail doesn't carry a lot of passengers. And, and bus, of course, um, is, is more important than rail for passengers, but not nearly as important as the automobile um, and air dropping tremendously. So. Um, within these regions, if you're very interested in, in the particular regions like the Austin region, seeing a 56% increase um, of travel demand. Now, this is not with a minute by minute or even hour by hour travel time feedback, but you can imagine that's gridlock. <laughs> that's absolute gridlock. I don't care if these vehicles fall at, follow at one second or even half second headways, this will gridlock the system. Um, so it's interesting that we didn't see that feedback on the gridlock in the model. Um, it was run with, I think, four broad times a day. So you have your AM peak, your, your afternoon peak, and you have your midday and kind of a long overnight period. And it's just amazing to me that this didn't, this rose this much in these particular settings. So that would be um, choking and, and, and awful. And you can see it here in these volume uh, to capacity ratios in, in red. Uh, so a lot of um, link congestion along the I-35 corridor, especially in the Houston region. Um, it's already bad before autonomous vehicles, but it is extra bad after the autonomous vehicles. So a lot of um, times a day where the volume to capacity ratio is above one. <laughs> so demand exceeds supply. So you're getting queuing on those links. And it can go on for hours, unfortunately. And so almost 10% of the links in the system have um, a volume to capacity ratio that's above one after you add the autonomous vehicles. And you're all familiar with congestion, I'm sure, in your own regions, but it, it can get pretty bad in the afternoon. Um, right now with COVID, we're not seeing so much, but you know, I think we'll, we'll come back to a lot of that traffic. Um, the air travel falling dramatically. So that's part of what shows up on those corridors is um, air travel becoming less interesting because it's expensive. And once you get to your destination, you often need a car anyway. So you have to go wait in the rental car line. So it'd be kind of nice to leave whenever you want and go directly to your destination um, by on the ground, uh, except for the congestion that's probably gonna be happening there. Uh, so total VMT or vehicle miles travel for the region, almost a 40% increase and freight travel rising in many of the commodity classes, but not the same way we saw it when we looked at the entire nation. So this is just focusing on this triangle. Another thing we do, of course, is look at passengers. In this case, um, the air travel or long distance travel impacts of uh, these self-driving vehicles, making uh, it easier for you to sleep and maybe skip even stopping at a hotel when you're staying on the ground uh, between you know, origins and destinations across the continental US in this case. And it affects not just your mode choice, um, but your destination choice. So a lot of people will stop traveling internationally and they'll say, hey, let's just go to um, Yosemite or Yellowstone or Calgary or something and they'll stay on the ground. Um, and so the airlines, you know, will not see this, this constant upward trend, I think that they've enjoyed uh, for many years until COVID of course is wiping them out. Um, we work with microdata area zones here that have um, been, it's a lot finer than the data we can get the, uh, for businesses. So these are for passengers. Um, and the data we started with was synthesized by a wonderful consultant for the FHWA. And so they gave us all the trips that they think would normally happen in a given year. This was the year 2010, however, so it's 10 years behind us at this point. And they have all sorts of information on those trips as well as how many people are traveling together, you know, and how did they get to the airport, these kinds of details. Um, and so here's some of the top uh, air travel pattern of pairs for the US it, it, for the work employer purpose. Okay, so kind of a business trip, uh, a lot between New York and DC, of course, and, and Atlanta may be passing through. Um, these are big hubs, of course, Atlanta and Dallas and Chicago are, are big hubs for um, people passing through. 
And when we added the autonomous vehicle, um, so it's just another alternative. Um, it does affect the destination choices, not just the mode choices. We're using a nested logit again. Um, and let's see, <laughs> we, we had to try to calibrate our model to match these trips that are pretty detailed uh, for that were already created for the nation. And so um, we, we were simulating these tours by different modes. And this is a log scale, by the way, of how many trips were taking place. We were making some assumptions on what cars cost per marginal mile traveled if you already own a car and what your value of time is being trapped in that car, basically, how much you'd pay to save an hour of, of, of being on the road in that car, often driving, which is, you know, a burden for the driver. And um, we were able to get, you know, reasonable correlation in our predictions versus their data, but it was imperfect. And so I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> um, what we did is we pivoted off of their predictions then um, with our, our model. So we took our new percentages and that way you, we didn't you know, end up with completely different uh, predictions. So you couldn't compare apples with apples. Um, and, and again, these are the assumptions we made um, on autonomous vehicles now, just 20 cents a mile on the marginal mile. Um, and it lowers your value of time because people won't really notice congestion if um, they're not having to drive oftentimes. If they can just look at their phone or fall asleep, they often don't even really notice the congestion outside their, their car window. <laughs> Um, and, and these are some of the before versus after impacts um, for, I guess, some of the, the shorter distances, <laughs> although th these are all long distance trips, so they're all over 50 miles uh, in one way. And then these are the very long distance trips um, that they're, they were showing um, sort of before and after. So a lot of detail, again, in this case, as you can imagine, big losses for the airlines, big gains for the car, um, which doesn't have to be an autonomous car. It can be uh, a, a conventional vehicle as well. Um, but there are big benefits for the, the long distance travelers and you'll see um, the autonomous vehicle market penetration, um, almost half of all driving after, after these vehicles become fully available. So not near term, but like the year 2060, we're trying to get a sense of if the year 2060 and that technology were owned right now and available to us at those prices, how many of us would be using it? Um, and if conventional vehicles were still permitted, which I don't think they will be in 2060, quite honestly, it's just ethically too dangerous uh, to allow human driving on uh, public roadways at that point. And um, the car, you know, um, for a one way less than 500 miles, maybe a, a plus 5%, but the longer distance you're seeing some, some big ones and then the air travel falling dramatically. So. Um, you know, maybe 51% market share, but not that 51% longer distances, just five to 12% longer distances. And the airlines domestically losing about half of their business due to this, this trend uh, relative to a, a no auto automation uh, future. If we look at vehicle miles traveled, we're seeing about 6% and 11% in these shorter distance and longer distance markets. Uh, so about 10% overall on our highways added to our roadways and air again, about 47%, just in line with the, the number of trips that are falling in the air sector. Um, if you look at distances, that's kind of interesting. Um, so all modes, you know, I guess um, the market shares are not very high. Uh, personal vehicles are, are, are remain very high across the nation, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, and then you can look state by state. So we looked at some of the bigger states here. These are some of the most populous states. And, and of course, some of these are, are the less populated states. Um, but you know, some, some big uh, travel distance, uh, distance uh, changes over the course of a year, uh, maybe 10% in those bigger states and, and maybe as high as 13% for a small state like Kansas. Um, on its roadways. And these may be people that, that aren't stopping in Kansas, right? They're just driving right through. Um, but that, that is a lot of congestion and a lot of wear and tear for them. Um, so complex choice process, just like it was with freight, just like it was with the mega region, and maybe a 10% increase in ground travel distances just from this piece of the puzzle. So there's a lot of other reasons that you're going to see more travel on the ground. But for these long distance travelers, we're seeing them adding about 10% to the ground travel distances and airlines losing about 50% of their domestic business. So where the both the origin and the destination are in the continental US. 
also using the continental US, where should we put uh, charging stations for our long distance all electric vehicles, which I hope all of you own. Uh, your garage will smell awesome. Uh, and you know, it's you don't have to deal with a hazardous material. So petroleum is a really hazardous material. You don't want your kids breathing that stuff. You don't want to touch that stuff. So, um, but a charging takes a long time. So we want these really expensive, fast chargers next to maybe a Starbucks or a little restaurant or something uh, for you to be able to once a year drive to Yellowstone or whatever you want to do in your all electric vehicles. Okay. Um, so there's not a lot of these DC fast chargers. Of course, Tesla does have its own network and those are only for Tesla owners and they can fill up 80% of your battery in 30 minutes. Um, they don't wanna to top it off too fast so they'll start to slow the charging rate as you get close. Um, but we, we, you know, we don't have as many fast chargers as we might like to allow everybody to electrify without range, uh, you know, anxiety and this kind of thing. Uh, but it is expensive to get these high speed um, supply equipment is what it's called electric vehicle supply equipment. And of course, uh, we have range limitations. I think right now, uh, Tesla may be, uh, have a, may have a 400 mile battery and um, the Scion and maybe the smart car have about 53 miles. And of course, there's like the, the Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid. And so you can stop and, and charge that while you're doing your long distance trips as well. Um, but some of these manufacturers are not allowing uh, fast charging, uh, super fast charging of their vehicles. And um, I, our, our Model 3, which is the less expensive one, it costs about $32,000. Um, has about 220 mile range. And, and that's why our, our garage smells so great, guys. <laughs> it's because it doesn't have petroleum. Uh, but I do have a hybrid electric vehicle, a Prius, and it goes over 500 miles on one fill up, uh, you know, and just it gets like 52 miles per gallon. So uh, that's pretty great. But where should we put the charging stations? Um, it's a tricky problem. It's a non polynomially hard problem. And um, we, we're saying, well, what if we only have, you know, enough money to fund 50 of these things? Where should we put them? What if we had enough money to fund 250 of these, like under the, the VW Dieselgate settlement? Um, we're getting a lot of charging stations across the nation, mostly in cities. But on the for these long distance travelers, how can we make them feel like they don't have to worry if they want to drive to Yellowstone or Manhattan? They can do it, um, and you can right now. You can drive anywhere in this country with a Tesla. I'm just not sure it, it um, and, and you can drive with these fast charging station uh, options, uh, but that is only if you buy a Tesla. And of course there can be queuing and, and um, excess demand for some of those cords, um, especially on a holiday weekend. <laughs> so that's the only time I, I hear about those, those charging stations filling up is, is um, big, big travel weekends. Um, but we're allowing the vehicles to have different ranges. So this is called an all electric range. And we're trying to maximize completion of those trips using a battery only vehicle. So not a plug in hybrid, okay? And not a hybrid, but a battery only. And um, we also took into account some of the Tesla station locations to try to pick other locations to complement that system. And we were also looking at cost minimization uh, because it costs a lot to have big batteries and carry those around with you. And of course the stations themselves also cost a lot and, and the wait time at the stations is, is worth something. So we're taking into account all of that. We're using the same data set that I was talking about for the long distance travel because we're trying to complete those trips. There's a lot of almost a trillion automobile trips per year back in the year 2010 that are over 500 or 50 miles um, one way. And um, Paul has a question. Feel free to type it in there, Paul. I see you're raising your hand. Uh, the shortest path distances um, were used to, to, and we also had to simplify the network uh, because this was just way too complex to try to find the optimal station locations. We had to run this on a supercomputer here at UT. UT has some of the best supercomputers in the world, and, and you know, we definitely had to cluster. So we, we simplified the network into these zone systems. And here you can see a lot of the, the big, the heavy um, travel like LA, San Diego, and San Jose, Sacramento maybe, and Portland, Vancouver. Um, and here's what the, the network looked like that, that caught almost all the trips uh, or would, would allow for almost every long distance trip in this nation. Uh, we had a very uh, 
you know, complex at times solving this system of equations. So this is constrained. And of course, these are integer solutions um, for these yes, no location decisions. Um, and then we were able to see how many trips we were able to complete, how many Americans could get to Yellowstone or Yosemite um, in their electric vehicles. And, and the more charging stations, of course, across the nation on that x-axis, the higher you're going to go. And then um, the, the battery pack size. So the 300 mile vehicles, um, you, pretty much everybody can make it with just um, 100 of these stations across the nation if you place them thoughtfully. And if you have, like I have, I have a 220 uh, Tesla Model 3, um, you know, you get to 93% and then almost 100% if there's just 150. And Tesla has already, I think, put um, at least 300, maybe 400 it has plans for on the ground. So you're in really good shape with a Tesla, but we don't want them to be the only manufacturer. We'd really like to see Ford and uh, General Motors and Toyota doing this as well uh, to allow for deep decarbonization of our, our emissions. Um, so pretty amazing results if you do it smart. Um, and, and of course, right now, they're just trying to add stations every 100 or 200 miles. They're not really doing uh, the solution this way, but this is a, a nice way to do it, I think. And you can serve a lot, not just the number of trips, but you can serve a lot of the vehicle miles traveled. So these are the percentages. They're pretty similar, although they're a little bit lower um, for these smaller battery packs. And um, Let's see, we, we also said, okay, well, this is where they are, in case you're wondering where you live, if you live in the, this nation, um, if you only had 50 stations and you had a battery pack of 150 miles, which I think you all will if you buy a battery electric vehicle, this is where you'd place them. So heavy on the East Coast, uh, heavy around the LA and, and, and San Francisco, Sacramento markets. And of course, Tesla sells a lot of vehicles on this West Coast, also here in Austin, a lot of Teslas. I'm not sure about where you live, but um, you know, Tesla knows where it's selling its vehicles. So it's actually gone heavy on its um, fast chargers in, in those markets, especially the, the West Coast market. Um, and then if you had only, if you got to have hundred stations, you would start filling this in. And if you got to have 150 stations or 200, this is kind of what the network would look like. We're really ignoring the Dakotas. You can see Montana, Wyoming, uh, Idaho gets one. <laughs> But if you add more stations, um, you know, if you could plan for that, this is probably what it would look like. Or if you could um, complement Tesla's existing system with 100 new stations, where would you place them? So interesting applications, thanks to um, the amazing programming and, and mathematical capabilities of the students here in, in UT's transportation engineering group. Um, I, I think I, I need to kind of keep going here because it is, it is a long presentation. I've just showed you well, I've showed you four parts. So let me get to part five, which is now Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's in Minnesota. This is called the Twin Cities. Um, we've got about seven counties in the Metropolitan Planning Organization and almost 10 million person trips per day happening there. And we're using code called MATSIM to study shared autonomous vehicles. So these are vehicles that can pick you up, drop you off, go pick up somebody else, maybe pick up somebody along the way if you want to use dynamic ride sharing. Uh, Uber Pool and Lyft Line do that. And I, I highly recommend it to try to reduce your, your carbon footprint. Um, so share the ride. It, it takes longer, but you save a lot of money if you do it. Um, and what we did here is we restricted curb idling because a lot of cities don't want Uber and Lyft just stopping anywhere. Uh, they can accidentally bump buses and create all sorts of traffic issues. So on um, streets that have more than like 400 um, pickups or drop offs on that curb per day, Hounan um, said, sorry, we've, we can't stop here. I mean, you could stop, but you immediately must leave. You cannot idle here between waiting for your next call. And so he ended up building 134 parking lots um, with about 500 vehicle capacity around the region. And here you can see inside Minneapolis and St. Paul what that might look like. So where those really busy curb sections exist so that he, you might have to require these things park off street. And so how does this affect the shared autonomous vehicle system? My students model these systems all the time. Uh, and so they've modeled Chicago and Bloomington and Austin again and again, uh, but also Minneapolis, St. Paul and some faith regions as well. And so um, they, these agents, they're, they're tracking each one of them. They're tracking all the travelers and there's mode choice usually enabled. I think not in this particular application with Matt Sim. 
software, but um, you know, there's a lot of complexity here. <laughs> so these are agent-based models, not just for the travelers, but for the vehicles themselves. And not everybody necessarily chooses an SAV, but in this model, we did say, okay, 100% SAV use. Um, we couldn't simulate everybody. It was just too much for the supercomputer. So I think he might've simulated about 10% of the travelers. And he found that when you do restrict the curb use on those 400 curbs, you end up with more travel, more vehicle miles travel, because they have to exit those busy sections and, and go drive around in a parking lot and then come back out to get people. Um, and so about 7% more empty. This E is not for electric. This is for empty vehicle miles traveled, which is too bad. Um, with these SAVs also have to work harder. So they're running um, instead of like nine hours a day or 10 hours a day, they might be working 11 or 12 hours a day. Uh, so they're busy. They're busy creatures. They're busier than you and me. <laughs> you can put them to work at night delivering pizza or something and, and extend that workday for these vehicles. Um, if you want to do dynamic ride sharing, that's harder if you force these vehicles to park off the curb uh, for their idling periods. Um, so the dynamic ride sharing fell and that's where you're sharing a ride with a stranger. It's like a mini bus, a tiny bus, maybe a four seater bus. Um, and it's on demand and it's, it's very, you know, route and destination uh, specific to the travelers that are using it. Um, so they lowered those dynamic ride uh, sharing trips, increased the wait times, I'm afraid. So it was harder for the vehicles to get to uh, the travelers across the region. And, and we um, simulated it not just across the whole region, but also focusing on, on the Twin Cities so that we could simulate 20% of the travelers in that city, in those two cities and the area between them. And so the wait times went up. But I can tell you, if you're, if you're reliant on a uh, SAVs in the Twin Cities, your wait times are going to be about two minutes. So when they go up by 20% or 19%, you're probably not going to notice. Um, if you live in the boonies of the region, your wait times might be about five, six minutes on average. Uh, so again, a, a, an 11% increase, not, not a big deal for you. Um, I think Hanan was trying different fleet sizes. So he was having one SAV to serve five travelers, which is about 20 trips a day because each traveler makes three, more than three trips a day on average. Um, and his empty vehicle miles traveled was anywhere from seven to 14%. So that's one of the downsides of autonomous vehicles. I don't think any of us should be allowed to let our private autonomous vehicle drive empty unless it's a true emergency but these fleets will be allowed to, okay? And so that's one of the, the downsides, just like with Uber and Lyft, you have these vehicles driving around without any passengers, okay? And so we want that to be as efficient as possible. Um, in this case, this was a pretty generous uh, fleet ratio, just uh, they only served, you know, 20 trips per day, each of these vehicles. And so they weren't working that hard. Um, and depending on which geofence we were simulating, the trips were either short or they were long. So you would get different uh, daily work schedules for those vehicles. If we only had one vehicle for 15 travelers, so like one vehicle serving 50 trips a day, um, it's, 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 there, there's not, a lot of vehicles are not free so that you're having to pick vehicles that are sitting farther away. And so you're ending up with more empty vehicle miles traveled and uh, pretty, pretty busy work days because they're trying to help everybody get to their destinations. And so the delays are going up, um, but dynamic ride sharing definitely helps. It, it saves money, it, it saves workday for those vehicles, and it saves response times um, because you don't have to wait until an empty vehicle becomes available. You can share the ride, of course. Try to fill that vehicle. There's a lot of empty seats in it. Um, the Twin City simulations averaged, so when we focused in on the simulations, there was more ride sharing possible in those sort of more dense locations and, and shorter wait times um, because, you know, they're just things are closer to one another if you're focused on a, a small geofence. And so these fleets, when they do arrive, they will be geofenced and they might be in like a 10 square mile geofence and eventually a 20 and a 50 and maybe a hundred and then maybe a, you know, a, a, a limitless geofence, uh, which is what we kind of experienced with Uber and Lyft right now. And you'll still have Uber and Lyft. So you'll still have these conventional drivers um, supplementing these fleets. Uh, but someday those will probably not be allowed. Human drivers will probably not be allowed. Uh, Hanan was also looking, where does the empty vehicle miles travel uh, occur? Well, mostly in neighborhoods with lower trip density. So lower land use densities in, in a variety of directions, not towards the core. 
of the cities. Um, and then most of the vehicle miles traveled and anti-vehicle miles traveled was actually on the freeways and highways as well. Um, so that's where a lot of distance gets traveled as, as you go to pick up people in, in the fastest uh, response time. Uh, Chicago is a much bigger region and uh, Murti, who's on the line, I think, and can answer some of the questions. Murti, feel free to answer questions in the chat box um, or in the Q&A box for me. Um, the the Minneapolis-St. Paul response times were not that different across the region. So uh, most people were getting average response times in most neighborhoods under six minutes, uh, but it does get amazing in the downtowns, I have to say. It's, it's pretty seamless. Of course, energy and emissions, in addition to all that empty driving, um, are a big issue. And so how Non was taking a look at different types of vehicles and he had range constrained vehicles. Um, and when you use a battery only electric vehicle, you know, it has to fill up and, and charge its batteries more than once a day uh, because it's traveling like 300 miles a day or more. So usually these fleet owners are not gonna buy a 300 mile or a 400 mile battery. Uh, not in the in the near term, but long term they they might. Um, but it's not so bad to fill up if you have a fast charging station nearby. It's just that there's going to be a little more empty travel as those vehicles leave uh, the work zones and, and start head to these these charging stations. And and he was also looking at the emissions impacts of doing all this. So he took. Um, a U.S. sedan, not a suburban, you know, these huge, uh, grossly sized vehicles. He took a, a, a smart sized vehicle and made that the fleet vehicle, but then he compared it to my Prius and then he compared it to something that's not as efficient as my Tesla. So um, I don't know if this is a Model S or something. I've got the Model 3, the smaller battery pack. I, I get like 125 MPG in that thing, equivalent, okay. Um, so electric vehicles, as you probably know, are way more efficient. Um, electricity is just way more efficient than combustion engines. And so um, both the, the hybrid and the electric vehicle save a lot of energy, even if that electric vehicle is having to drive a little bit further to get to those charging stations. Uh, I don't think this is life cycle energy, sorry. So he didn't take into account the embodied energy of the vehicle. Um, or those charging stations or those gas stations. There's actually a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and, and other emissions from uh, refining and, and transporting and, and mining petroleum. So nothing is free. Um, it all has uh, downsides. But this is, you know, this is just based on their operating energy as well as their operating emission species. Um, so, you know, not only are we concerned about greenhouse gases, we are concerned about sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen and um, volatile organic compounds and particulate matter, especially fine particulate matter that kills like a hundred thousand people early every year in this country alone. You could imagine in India and China and places with worse air quality, they are losing, you know, potentially a million people or more every year. Um, so that is very, very sad. Um, this is 10 micrometers. Um, usually it's about 2.5 micrometers or less where you start to really get worried about the lung inhalation over time. Uh, in any case, the, the hybrids, you know, are, are reducing versus this conventional vehicle. So this is in percentage terms. Um, and then we costed it out. So we monetize those emissions. So, you know, carbon's not the only thing. And if carbon's $50 per carbon dioxide is $50 per ton. Um, all these other, especially particulate matter, carries very heavy costs. And so um, if you monetize it, you can get a sense of that reduction per passenger mile travel or passenger mile served. And so this was, I think, the a hybrid and this was the um, all electric vehicle. <laughs> Not sure why the all electric went up, but it looks like it has this big blue component, which is SO2. But as we retire coal fired power plants, we won't get that anymore in the um, upstream emissions of those, you know, zero emission vehicles. They have plenty of emissions at the power plants, but we are retiring these. Um, so I think this is, this number is too high already. <laughs> We've retired a lot uh, because of fracking and, and other reasons. Uh, by the way, photovoltaics or solar power is just four cents a kilowatt hour at utility scale. So not on your rooftop, which is probably more like 13 cents a kilowatt hour, but utility scale solar is amazing. And if it hadn't been for the fracking boom, that thing, it would have taken off even more here. So retire those coal plants, you'll get rid of this component right here and you'll see those all electric vehicles become cleaner over time, which of course they will. Um, 
besides these shared autonomous vehicle fleet in, uh, simulations, you know, there's all these other impacts of automation. And so I wanted to just take one slide to tell you about that. So Ju Yong Lee has a paper about the various ways we, you know, we're going to make driving easier. So guess what? There's going to be more of it. Um, and, you know, the, the smart vehicles might make better route choices and save us a little bit of energy, but there's all these, this pent up demand by people who don't own vehicles or have bad uh, sight at, at night, like elderly people or um, persons on special medications. And, and you will, you will um, cannibalize some of your transit use in, in many cities. And we've seen that, I think in San Francisco, of course. Um, so you will get more driving by other types of persons um, out there who are not you know, in vehicles that much, even like 15 year olds, right? And 13 year olds, I think we'll probably let them call one of these vehicles eventually. So you'll get some added driving there. And then you've got the empty driving by those shared autonomous vehicles as they navigate between one and another. Uh, hopefully you will get ride sharing finally, especially if you introduce congestion pricing on your roads. And I recommend credit-based <laughs> congestion pricing or decongestion pricing. You can get uh, more and more people to carpool in these with dynamic ride sharing. But in the meantime, just that empty driving and that longer distance travel that we were talking about. So the airlines um, seeing you know more travel on the ground. So Airlines are not that efficient, I have to say. So if you can fill a Prius and drive on the ground, you can definitely beat an airplane. Um, I think for the next, I don't know, maybe forever, you, uh, an airplane will not be able to beat that. Um, if filling up a Prius with three or four people on the ground will beat that. But it's still, you know, more, more driving um, on the ground. So that, that will be more energy, I think, there. We'll have smoother driving cycles, so hopefully more eco-mode type driving once we let go of the wheel and we stop hitting that acceleration pedals too much. Um, and we, but we do also have a lot of power demands on these smart vehicles. So they have sensors, they have computers. And right now they are probably consuming like 30% more energy for the deployments that you see in the US um, because they're not as efficient as they will be under mass production. Um, but long-term we can expect it to be maybe 10% more power demand. Um, and then faster travel, so people may be being able to travel at higher speeds where drag resistance is significant, and so that adds um, some inefficiencies at the high speed range. Um, we hope to see platooning and, and tighter vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle connectivity, which not only reduces, um, you know, or increases speeds, but it can reduce the drag on some of those trucks, and so, and maybe on the passenger cars, not that you would want to follow that closely to really reduce your drag. Um, but, you know, we've just been looking at some of the literature and it suggests maybe at two to 19%, depending on how often this is done. This will require a mandate, by the way. These vehicle manufacturers do not want their cars following that tightly. Um, it will require at some point the government say that if you're in an autonomous vehicle, you must follow at a one second headway or less to get the drag benefits, um, which is scary. For passengers uh, to go like on a half second headway. I don't think you want to do that, uh, but I do hope you want to get in those shared or autonomous taxis and share your rides with other people um, because I think most of us should feel pretty guilty about our carbon footprints. Um, you know, unless you're poor and, and living in India or something, your carbon footprint is probably not long term sustainable. Um, so that, you know, that can reduce um, some, of the, some of the emissions, but it's not dramatic, I'm afraid. Uh, in this country. And, and then finally, we might have in the very long term, these smart intersections, not just, you know, tight headways on highways, but that you need the signals and you need the um, stop signs and stuff to be smart. And so people can, vehicles can traverse those intersections quickly as long as there's no pedestrians or cyclists waiting. So that's always a, a big issue. And you, you might save some energy there as well, not having to stop. Now, the biggest thing that we're hoping to see is electrification of these drivetrains because um, we need all these computers and these sensors on board. So be really helpful for the manufacturers. And we do expect them to do this in at least a hybrid electric vehicle platform. Uh, most of them have been experimenting with plug-in hybrids and um, Cruise, which is partly owned by GM, is all electric. Um, and so that's, um, helps make it much easier to have the computers on board and everything and keeps it clean, at least from a tailpipe perspective. And of course, many of the grids in the US and Canada are super clean 
already. So that can bring down your energy impacts dramatically, but it does depend on your feedstocks, okay? So that's it for this, this presentation. I um, is a lot to, to take in, uh, but we have a long period of time now for questions and answers. And so uh, I'm gonna let Hai Feng tell me what, what first question I should address. All right. Thank you, Kara, for a very rich and fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, I, I, I found it very interdisciplinary. And I think that's the strength of regional scientists. And I, I certainly have some questions I want to ask, ask from uh, as an urban planner or economic development person. But I'll go to the audience first. Uh, I, I think that's a very quick. Uh, uh, I know Rick has been waiting for a while. And uh, you know what, Rick? Can you, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and ask a question? Rick Church? Actually, I, I inadvertently uh, raised my hand, I guess. Um, but I do, I, first of all, a very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. And you covered uh, quite a large waterfront in this. Um, I do have uh, uh, two, two comments. Um, the first is this uh, network of, of charging stations. I, I noticed that that um, it really doesn't support any much in the way of local uh, demand for for charging, and the more dense our neighborhoods and cities become, um, the greater uh, number of public charging stations we'll have to have on on our streets and parking lots and so forth. And um, I was wondering if number one, you'd you'd actually looked at um, what might be required for some place like Austin, Texas to supply um, all of the local demands for charging for vehicles? Great question. So I typed in the chat box that um, generally what we see happening with um, non long distance travel is people prefer to charge at home and which may not be a conventional single family detached dwelling unit uh, with a garage, for example. Um, and a lot of people trickle charge or slow charge on just the 120 volt that we have already here in the US In Europe, they're lucky all of their outlets are already at 220. Um, so they can power at twice the rate approximately that we can but um, those of you who live in multifamily um, or no garage, you know, that is a trickier issue. So some of those people actually um, don't try to fight with their neighbors over the, the few outlets that are available. Um, and of course, the property owners are worried about how much electricity they're giving away. So they have to have these like credit card swipes at those settings. That's the best place, though, because the car is parked for such a long duration. Um, but they, they some of them will actually locate near these Tesla um, city charging spots, which are not the, the super chargers, but they're, they're very fast and they're generally co-located with um, shopping. And so they're nicely located. Of course, if you go to Whole Foods Market or maybe a Walmart or something, they often will have uh, charging for you. But I think it's usually level two, um, which would be like charging at any outlet in Europe. <laughs> um, so it's maybe twice as fast as your home outlet. Uh, at our home outlets, um, so we've now moved, so we've done it twice, we've had to install a level two uh, charger in the garage and it cost us about $400 with a local subsidy, but I think it wouldn't cost more than $800 to add that to your property um, if you can access it. And so if you're not the property owner, then you know the issue becomes how quickly can you get to and, and do you have to pay? Um, I think many cities also have, you know, like at libraries and things like that. So in my old neighborhood, a lot of people would park there. They would just walk home from the library and park at the library to get their vehicle charged because they wanted to save money, I guess. But it, it really is pennies, uh, pennies to charge these vehicles. So the big expense is buying that battery pack up front and just don't crash your car, okay? Because that's a big upfront investment, you know, maybe another $4,000, $5,000 for that vehicle. So you really want to protect that vehicle to make sure you can you basically get back so much of that savings with uh, lower maintenance costs and, and things like that. Um, and of course, lower energy costs. Um, I do want to say, Rick, that we have a paper. Our first paper about EV charging stations was for Seattle. And we just looked at where um, people were parked the longest using their household travel survey. And then we said, OK, if we also want to minimize 
walking distances. So we want everybody to have access from where they're parked away from home each day. So like businesses, um, usually workplaces, but you know, it could be a Walmart um, and you're just shopping. And so we place them in, in heavy parking zones away from the homes though. And, and so that was also a mixed integer program. And then we've done the Massachusetts area. We simplified the network and we did just Eastern Massachusetts. So that is also kind of um, not intra-urban, but uh, not inter-urban, but intra-urban travel. And we were maximizing profits of those who would invest in these stations. So we were also deciding how many cords to place. And th that was Yan Tao Huang's work. Uh, so we've got like four different EV charging station uh, papers at my website for these different settings. Uh, is, is that helpful, Rick? Yes, very much so. Um, I, I have one question about the, um, your mode choice within the context of freight and dealing with rail. Um, quite some time ago when I did a, uh, a study on the potential impact of the loss of a rail bridge, um, I was struck by the fact that almost nobody really uh, works with a rail network within the context of capacities. Uh, partly because it's really hard to discern exactly what a capacity is of a rail network across uh, the U.S. And so I was wondering, you know, because we found out that, you know, this loss of this one particular rail bridge on the average meant that every rail car that had to go, was normally routed over that bridge would have to be rerouted about 450 miles. And so, um, but the, the real question was even with that rerouting, we could not really say that that was a, a good estimate because a lot of the rail traffic across the United States is at capacity. So I'm wondering exactly how you dealt with capacity issues uh, within the context of looking at the modes between rail and, and truck. Yeah, yeah. So only trucking network was congested. Like we have link performance functions, for example, and how fast they congest on those, but we don't have them on the rail system. And of course, it's very link specific. So there are double-sided locations for passing, but you're going to have to wait. So you really have to do it like on an agent-based model, um, you know, link by link with these these corridors that are double track, thank goodness, but mostly it's not. So really, I think um, rail experts for many years have felt that much more double tracking is needed, especially since uh, so many rail uh, corridors were abandoned. And um, yeah, did it, was that uh, was that crossing, by the way, forever abandoned? Pardon? Were, did they completely lose that bridge um, forever? They weren't <clears throat> planning to replace it? No, no. Um... This was this was suppose we lost this bridge. It oh. was it was uh, it was looking at how we might model the impact of a loss of some particular type of infrastructure. In this case, uh, we chose a bridge at Sandpoint, Idaho. Um, but uh, but our but our technique was we're supposed to be transferable and applied almost anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Now I think with uh, computing resources today, you would have to micro simulate. You would want to micro simulate that. Um, and yeah, it would be a little mm -hmm. painful to get the the tracking right um, because it, it is very uh, specific to location. Um, and some of those sightings are very short. But it also your um, your mode choice between um, rail and truck seems to increase. Um, the uh, break-even point for rail to the point that there's a lot of traffic that will no longer be efficient on the rail versus the truck. Yeah, but you know, trucking can change. I mean, certainly with the congestion on those corridors and then um, carbon taxes and things like that. So diesel's not as, um, you know, diesel internal combustion engines are not as efficient as the, uh, the rail. Uh, but of course, rail isn't door to door generally, and it's it's um, pretty slow. So. True, true. Very nice. I Thanks. enjoyed your presentation very much.
Thank you so much. Uh, David Plain, did you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so yeah, Rick was getting towards one of my two questions, but your fir the first part of your talk, and there's so much to um, to get through here um, in the in the in the overall talk. But the first part, you showed some real substantial mode shifts to uh, autonomous trucks. Um, I was wondering about the energy implications of that, which you just talked about. But also, what about the infrastructure impacts? Are we going to need huge investment in, in more roadways? Well, I, I really feel like if we priced our roadways properly, and I don't mean 25 cents a mile, I mean like five cents a mile, and then bottlenecks get priced uh, high during those certain times of day, we wouldn't need any more roadways. Um, we just kind of leave it, you know, it's like a tragedy of the commons every day, um, especially at the bottlenecks. And so I, I just feel that it's just kind of a waste to keep acquiring more rights of way and expanding these big, ugly pieces of infrastructure and letting people just do whatever they want. Um, I do feel like we haven't raised the gas tax, for example, in this state in 27 years, and that's true of most states. So it's still 40 cents per gallon when you add the federal and the state portions um, which is ridiculous uh, given the uh, dangerous nature of this substance and of course the climate um, concerns and then the military involvement that for decades compromised our nation and so many others being dependent on Middle East oil. Um, and so there's just a lot of downsides. You know, We still have that military involvement. We've got long-term issues because of that choice. Uh, we really don't need all of this capacity, but we, we aren't managing it properly. And yeah, from what we can see, there, there were those links. So we went from, I don't know, 6% to 10% uh, links with VC ratios, volume to capacity ratios over one. And um, if we were to zoom in temporally and do it on a more uh, dynamic scale, you know, it, it, it could be a lot worse um, rather than spreading the traffic. So, uh, but that, those were big, those were large scale simulations. So the, the feedbacks weren't as um, precise as you would like on the congestion side of things. Well, I know the, the backers of autonomous vehicles think you can pack them closer together. So therefore you can increase usage of existing roadways. But what, what about the wear and tear on, on, the, uh, on the surfaces and so on? Well, roadways are mostly um, designed to handle the heavy trucks, so they're the ones who beat it up, um, although any of us can knock over a sign, right, or, or destroy a guardrail, I think. Um, so many vehicles can do that, but the, the pavement itself is the most expensive component, and it's usually like seven inches deep, I guess, and then there's a lot of uh, gravel and stuff that goes underneath it, the understructure. And of course, if you build a bridge or you um, tunnel, those cost like a hundred million dollars per lane mile. Um, so stuff that's built at grade to a high, um, I guess, level of, of design is about $10 million per lane mile. So it's not cheap. And right now the DOTs can really only fund maintenance in most states. Uh, California, maybe Massachusetts have increased their state components of those taxes. Um, so they, have enough probably to maybe expand if they want. But like you said, um, we follow at about two second headways under congested conditions. And um, I think the AVs right now that are being tested follow at like three second headways. They're very cautious. They do not want to get too close and their computers make a wrong decision and hit the vehicle in front of them because they'll be on the front page of the news and it's not good for that, that company um, to ever have a crash on record, especially a, a deadly or injurious crash. So they're driving really cautiously right now. And the manufacturers are gonna be the deep pocket that's ensuring these vehicles effectively when you and I are not in control of the vehicle anymore. So they're gonna follow cautiously until we force them to follow at a one second headway. And maybe, um, maybe tighter headways in certain corridors. It's a little nerve wracking for the passenger, but. Um, that would definitely help on the highways, and that will also mean no needed expansion, except maybe at the bottlenecks. But if you start pricing, and credit base, by the way, is where all the congestion tolls, not the asset tolls, like the vehicle mile traveled fees, but the, the added congestion tolls, which are dynamic kind of, uh, or semi-dynamic, um, and very location specific, that revenue goes back to all the travelers in the region as a budget each month. So they all have about $40 a month 
to travel with. And um, if they need to go downtown they every day for work at a peak time of day, they may end up spending $60, $70 a month. And so they just, they're spending money out of pocket. And then some of us, we're just going to spend that money on renting e-bikes or transit, or we'll give it back to the system to allocate to low income households with workers in them and maybe children until they have tight time constraints on the roadway. Um, so that's how you kind of you give everybody, um, you know, an equal ownership. Um, I forget the name of the, the economist. It's, um, it's not Pagovian <laughs> and some things, but um, just to give everybody equal uh, ownership of that asset. Now, it is tricky drawing the line, like who's in, who's out, who gets this $40 a month and who doesn't. But at least it takes care of a lot of the equity and, and anxiety about the, the money. Um, and that, that, that little piece of it would, would help um, manage congestion dramatically. It would also promote carpooling. You know, so many vehicles are single occupant or maybe two occupant. Um, and, and so there's, there'd be a lot nicer marriage of, uh, and management of the system if we did that. Thanks, Kara. Sure, sure. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I think we have some, a few questions from the Q&A box. Uh, maybe we have a, Kara, have yes. a follow up on this. Uh, so I can questions. see this. So Brenda asked early on, are regular vehicles being replaced by auto autonomous vehicles or autonomous vehicles being added? So we did not take away conventional vehicles. Um, sometimes we simulate uh, that no more conventionals are allowed to be sold, you know? It's sort of like requiring automated braking, which should be required right now on all vehicles, but because we elected Donald Trump, we didn't get that. We also didn't get connected vehicles. Um, but you know, maybe under Biden, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration will allow um, some of these innovations to be required on the vehicles, and that will protect you. And in the long term, there may be this AVs only being sold protection. Uh, but in the meantime, there's going to be a mix. And so we allow both options to be sold. And so both options are available in almost all the simulations you saw, except that last one um, for Minneapolis St. Paul, where we said, okay, everybody's gonna try to use this SAV system. How's it gonna work? Um, and then Jeff Hewings was wondering about uh, multimodal freight trips. And so we had that IM case, which stands for intermodal, which is um, you know, multiple modes to complete the trip wasn't a big share, um, but it, you know, it might be a bigger share than we suggested there because a lot of uh, rail trips eventually has to board a truck um, or be, you know, trail, it has to trail a, a, a truck or a tractor. Um, so I'm, I wasn't, I'm not really sure what the implication was for the multimodals, but, you know, they, they could go up or down depending on the sector. So if they marry with the if they marry themselves with the the rail, they could they could go up. Uh, the problem is you usually need a driver for the pickup and the drop off, and so it may not make great sense. Those some of those intermodal legs are not that long by truck, and so it was really the longer distance markets that the autonomous trucks uh, tended to win over. And then Stephen in Nanjing, I guess, it says, are there extra energy damping effects on the existing local and regional grid networks due to surging demand? So um, I can tell you that a Tesla in expensive uh, power markets like California and Hawaii, Tesla will park a big battery at its supercharging station so that it doesn't have to pull that power down from the grid because that can really uh, require a lot of uh, infrastructure addition and the grid owner will charge you for it, uh, making that power cost like 40 cents or more per kilowatt hour, which would be really uneconomical. So they'll park a big battery at those sites and you can do that in other locations, but we do need the cost of the battery storage to go down for that to be a winner in Texas, for example. And so you're, you're absolutely right as we do add more electric vehicles, maybe even to a neighborhood like mine, you might be worried about the transformers even um, from like a level two charge, uh, a bunch of cars plugging in. So let me just tell you how awesome these cars are. Like my Tesla, I can tell it to not charge until midnight. So I don't let it charge at 5 p.m. in the summer when I'm coming home. That's the, the worst time of day during the summer when air conditioning units are on to plug in your vehicle and force it to charge. So you just tell the vehicle um, that you want to wait till midnight. And really, there should be communication with the vehicle to tell the vehicles when wind is high, which is usually nighttime, but there's specific times, you know, so wind is going up and down in West Texas, and 
it all we need is that communication. And so that's a little bit of demand management and that's not hard to do, but I haven't seen good applications of it. And I, we really need demand management to make better use of renewable feedstock. So really hoping to see that. Um, I can also tell you that if you live in an area where a lot of people have air conditioning, all your transformers have been upgraded. So you're pretty much fine adding EVs. Just don't do the high speed charging unless you really need it. So don't do the high speed charging. It's not great for your battery. Oftentimes if you do it, you know, every day or every week, and it's, it's certainly not great for the grid or for your um, utility bill if you're, if you're forced to pay the true cost of that charging. Uh, Stephen also has another question. Any consideration for and implications on incident management in mixed traffic? So I don't feel that AVs should be allowed to drive empty. And I don't think, uh, unless they are shared, autonomous vehicle fleets managed by a professional fleet manager that is always on call, uh, may have remote control of the vehicle, but one of the dangerous things about allowing remote control of your vehicles, as, as satisfying as that may sound uh, to some of the manufacturers, is that it introduces a line for hacking. And so you could have like a, a rogue agent take over that vehicle. You know, I don't think they'd probably kill anybody, but they could, you know, make people very scared. Um, and, and of course, vehicles are loaded guns. They are dangerous weapons and you can absolutely kill a lot of people at once. But mostly uh, we're pretty worried about the traffic implications if, if somebody decides to stall a vehicle by remotely um, commandeering it. And so um, I think though, you know, if you have a fleet, you've got people on the ground that can get to those vehicles quickly. We also don't want to allow like 10 year olds and six year olds to be in these vehicles by themselves. You're going to want somebody, you know, who's at least 15, I suppose. But, you know, one day they may work so well one day that we allow 10 year olds to use them to go to their their cello classes <laughs> without their parents, um, maybe meet the parent there. Um, I, I, I wonder, did I answer your question, Stephen? Did you want to unmute yourself? Well, I think uh, he'll need to uh, raise hand first. So like, uh, you know what, I probably can allow him to, if I can find him here. Um, I do want to give a shout out to David Plain, who I think is in Arizona. So he's got a Chevrolet Bolt, which is an all electric vehicle. And um, they charge it during the day when their solar panels are generating extra power. We also have solar panels on our first home. Uh, but utility scale is so cheap now, I feel bad buying solar panels for my roof, but you really want to talk to whoever manages your grid or whoever's supplying your power. In, in Austin, I'm very lucky it's municipally controlled, so the city council tells Austin Power to, to get lots of solar, and um, we are 60% carbon-free in Austin, but you, most of you are not, I'm afraid. You really have to talk to your private power um, to, uh, providers and tell them you want you want more and more solar, you want more and more wind, you want nuclear too. Uh, I'm afraid you're going to need that generally for your base uh, load management. Uh, but it is very safe the way they do it these days. It just takes forever with the regulatory red tape right now. And so we need to streamline that to, to protect the planet. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Prof. Uh, it's been a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed you. Yeah, I... I wanted to, to, to know the implications of uh, an unfortunate incident. You know, we cannot say all oh, that is roses. You know, we might, we might have a crash or something, or maybe miscommunication between the, the system. So if there is a system failure, um, how are we going to quickly, uh, you know, manage uh, the system, um, you know, to, to, to bring it back to work? Yeah, yeah, so we have, we, yeah. we have transportation system failures every day, right? So yeah, we sure. have uh, rail uh, lines that go, you know, cars that fall off the track. We have pedestrians killed all over the place. We have um, disabled trucks um, taking up a lane or two on major corridors. So we have this happen every day in all our modes, except for airline. Airline's pretty smooth, although when we have bad weather, the airline fleet can be stalled and that can ripple through the whole system. Um, but I think Stephen is worried that a rogue operator might take over the whole fleet of vehicles. Um, so I've never really heard of that just because the manufacturers don't plan to, to manage them that way. Um, they do understand the implications of 
you know, the fear and the immediate loss of all customers if a rogue operator were to take over the entire fleet. Um, so each uh, line of communication would be pretty separated and you may not have remote driving at all. So what you need is if a vehicle stops, you know, and starts causing traffic, you need to be able to pull it out quickly. And so the police would probably be the first on the scene and they need to be able to pull it. So there may be an unlock of the axle switch and to be able to push that vehicle out of the way. Um, and if it gets in a crash, well, it's just like any crash. I mean, people are stuck. Uh, so I, they generally will probably get in, um, you know, 50% to 90% in the long-term fewer crashes. So you're going to have big crash cost savings that are dramatic, um, you know, on the order of a trillion dollars a year uh, in this country. Uh, same thing for the value of time savings. If everybody were chauffeured by a self-driving vehicle, uh, that would be worth about a trillion dollars a year in this country. Uh, so there's tremendous benefits to it on the crash or the safety and, and time saving sides of, of things, but there's also serious congestion issues. And like he said, there's also this concern about you know, a system failure. I'm not sure how a bunch of vehicles would fail at once unless a rogue operator were allowed to somehow um, change all the code at once. And, and that's not the way these vehicles are designed. They're de designed to be quite independent or autonomous. Um, so I hope I answered your question, but feel free to type more into the chat box to help me ex understand it better. Uh, Brigetta and, uh, and Neil, and of course, hi Feng, do you guys have any questions for me or suggestions? Yeah, Prof, I'm, I'm, I think I'm answered. Um, thank you so much for that clarity. Over the whole thing is uh, quite enjoyable. Thank you. Really? Tara, I think we have a question, another question in the QA box there. Oh, how do I see that? Jason, okay. Jason, how do I see the shared fleets being deployed? If these are private fleets replacing transit service, I wonder about equity. Okay. So I think transit agencies should contract this service uh, to serve the, the low income um, and the, the needy. Um, but I do think the prices are gonna fall to a dollar per mile and, and eventually the cost is about 50 cents per mile from what we've stimulated uh, to do this. So that, that's much less than transit agencies pay right now per passenger mile. And of course you can fit multiple passengers into these vehicles. So we're talking like, 20 cents per passenger mile or something, which is unbeatable. Uh, so the transit agencies have more than enough money to fund the travel of low income people in most US regions. They couldn't do this for all of us. So we'd all wanna use transit if we had this on demand sort of response system. Doesn't have to be four seaters, could be eight seaters. You know, um, the cruise origin vehicle that just came out in San Francisco has no operator, no steering wheel, it seats six. Um, and so there, it's just three facing three. And I think there's seatbelts on there, but I'm not sure everybody uses them. Uh, and I think, yeah, that this is just a killer transit application. Although on some corridors and certainly where we have rail lines for light rail or, or commuter rail, you know, they can continue to try to bring people to those stations with these um, demand responsive autonomous vehicle fleets and try to uh, schedule them nicely so that people aren't waiting um, so long at the, the train station. Um, but of course, you don't want to over purchase a fleet and then underutilize it. So um, it'll be an interesting balance. But I really do think that the transit agencies should be contracting. And, and, and I hope that's something some of you might be interested in is specifying these contracts. If any of you is a transit expert, specifying these contracts so that Lyft and Uber and maybe um, ride Austin, which is another um, ride hailing app here in Austin, they, they all can serve as many people as they can get to quickly and they have to meet certain service uh, requirements. So these are low income people or people with uh, disabilities that can't uh, drive and they're getting either subsidized service or free service, maybe 10 rides a week for free. And then on top of that, they pay 20 cents a mile or something like that. And this is a big game changer for public transit. So um, I think Uber and Lyft and, and others would really like transit to, to buy a lot of those trips from them directly, which they already do, by the way. Taxi uh, cabs and Uber and Lyft, I think, already do get subsidies in certain markets to serve uh, passengers. 
And then uh, Rick has another question. How does high-speed rail in California compete with the autonomous vehicles? I don't think it can. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I feel like it is so difficult to acquire the right of way in most markets for high-speed rail. And then the efficiencies and the costs of that system are so high. Um, and when I say efficiencies be high, I mean, it, the energy is not that, uh, not much to say because the vehicles require they're very specialized vehicles and the track is special and the stations are expensive so it's a very expensive system and whenever you see money being spent you usually see energy being spent uh, and so the, these are, these are very hard to manufacture they're not mass manufactured vehicles it's not an efficient system and then high speed means a high drag so you do use a lot of energy to get these vehicles moving and, and they, they have to stop along the way at places you don't want to stop. <laughs> You're going all the way from LA to San Francisco. So uh, the travel times are, are not as competitive as you'd like. And of course, you're getting dropped off in San Jose, which is pretty low density. So your destination is probably out in the suburbs and you need to rent another ride. Uh, so it's not a door to door service. It's just really tough, I think, to compete with this, this technology option that we have coming. <laughs> Any other questions? So when we're when we were reading, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in the labor market and economic development. Uh, so it sounds to me, uh, uh, you believe that uh, there will not be a lot of uh, truck drivers job being lost from autom autonomous vehicles. Is that right? If I understand? Uh... Well, no, I mean, trucking is a big employer, but the demands of, or labor supply is pretty low in that. They, they work hard to try to find enough truck drivers. It's an awful job, so nobody really wants it. Um, so, but there will still be operators, you know, but they will be sort of replacing back office staff. Uh, so I do think these expensive assets will still have a human on board. You know, he or she may be talking to their spouse, they may be Zooming with their kids, they may be sleeping, they may be doing um, accounting instead of, you know, just try not to hit anything <laughs> while they're driving. So there's um, all these, I, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so you can see me. So they're, they, instead of having to do this for, you know, eight hours, which is awful, um, they can do things that are much more valuable to the company and to their them, themselves, including sleep. And so then that asset can keep moving across the nation and achieve a lot more. Um, so I think it'll be probably a good thing for the trucking sector, but some back office staff will lose their jobs. And then um, on TNCs like Uber and Lyft, yeah, that gig economy option for workers, you know, these contractors is, is gonna be much uh, fewer by the, the year 2050. But I think there'll be a mix of, of both types of service because it's just hard to produce that many autonomous vehicles that quickly to be able to, to meet the demand. So you're still gonna have traditional drivers, but the wages are going to fall because there's going to be this self-driving um, option. Um, but the self-driving cars need a lot of support right now. You know, they're not cheap. Um, they need people checking on them and checking their, their sensors, um, rebooting their systems every day, if not many times a day. Uh, so, you know, and then of course the, the LIDAR systems on top and, and the cameras and the radar and all of the graphic processing units. It's, it's an expensive vehicle right now. Thank you. Uh, so it seems like we still have a little time to answer the two questions from Q&A box. There's two new questions there. Yes, I'm going to start with Christina. Um, how close do you think AV technology is from being widespread? So I get that question all the time. Um, and so I say, well, you know, like it's hard to produce these vehicles and then it's hard to maintain them right now. Um, so they will only be in, in very specific markets. Like Waymo has been serving households in, in the Arizona suburb for a couple years. And, and now they're doing it without a safety driver. And Cruz just got to do this San Francisco demonstration now, but it's just a few vehicles. And so widespread, um, you know, to, for San Francisco to have a lot of self-driving vehicles, I mean, you have to probably wait at least 10 years before you are likely to get that when you order a, a vehicle like a, a ride hailing app on your phone. So you might not get lucky enough to have that option for another five to 10 years. And you'd have to be in a major city like a, a San Francisco or New York or in Austin, uh, because Austin is just a favorite among tech tech people. Um, similarly, Pittsburgh, some places where you have a lot of high tech concentration, you'll often have those demonstrations. 
and um, for you to be able to buy this technology at less than like a ten thousand dollar pop when you and have it work really well so that you don't even need a steering wheel that might be uh, 20 years before you feel that's really affordable to you and your family and and, and it works seamlessly with no steering wheel so um, yeah, Tesla though, if you go to the Tesla website, you can check a box and for like two or $3,000, you can order the autonomy package, I think. And um, because the, the cameras and, and radar are already on the vehicle, no LIDAR. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they don't have that additional redundancy of technology, um, but you can pay a few thousand dollars and get a, you know, that um, software added to this amazing vehicle. It's a rocket ship, okay? A Tesla is really a rocket ship. It is just a whole different thing. Um, for example, when you don't, when you don't have to brake, you just take your foot off the gas a little bit and it starts slowing. So you don't have that added response time of moving the foot to the brake pedal, unless you really want to come to a full stop then you would probably have to touch the brake eventually, but it's just a much smarter uh, design, I think, than we've been accustomed to for many years. Um, Jason says, do you expect any reductions in infrastructure requirements, like interchanges reaching the end of life? <laughs> oh my goodness. So replacing an interchange with an act grade facility, I, I don't recommend that. I think interchanges will be there for sure. Um, I, I think maybe in like 60 years, we might be able to get rid of traffic lights in many locations. Um, but if you have pedestrians or cyclists, I don't think that'll be automated. So they need to be able to see a red and, and, and green light without having to look at their phone to tell them whether it's green. Um, so I, I don't really see much infrastructure change except that parking, you probably don't wanna invest in parking facilities in expensive uh, settings where land is expensive because um, a lot of people hopefully will just be taking um, a self-driving vehicle that's shared into those settings and not needing to park this vehicle all day long and, and waste that resource. Um, Stephen from Nanjing is asking, from the results and implications, uh, efficient autonomous vehicles suggest total collapse of passenger traffic. No, it's an increase in passenger traffic. <laughs> It's an increase. Now, uh, on the air side, maybe you're worried about air side. So international air will continue to grow. It's domestic air where you see maybe a 50% reduction um, in, the, in the Texas Triangle where those distances are pretty short. You might see an 80% reduction in those ticket sales. But international ticket sales are still going to go up because people are not going to want to stay in a car for 500 hours and swim across an ocean or something to get to their destination. So I don't think airlines have, you know, they, they don't have to be completely fearful. Their, their airports were already getting, you know, over capacity anyway. So um, we were, we, we had some real issues with air. And of course it's a very inefficient mode in lots of ways. So um, it's a very expensive mode in lots of ways. All right. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. uh, all right. Getting in air travel, <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, uh, I think we are right on time. Uh, now it's uh, almost uh, 11.40. Uh, that's when we're supposed to uh, uh, finish this. Uh, thank you, Karen, for delivering a great uh, presidential lecture. Oh, we're using Zoom webinar, not meetings, so we cannot see a round of applause here, but uh, I'm sure the audience uh, appreciate your uh, great presentation here. Um, I also want to thank everybody for participating uh, and joining the Zoom webinar and uh, enjoying the rest of the NASC meetings. Yeah, I have um, a student competition in the transportation area and there'll be a couple of papers about autonomous vehicles this afternoon at two o'clock central. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy your lunch times and your, your coming sessions. And then of course, tomorrow and the next day. So we've got a lot of great, a lot of great paper presentations coming up. Um, look forward to seeing you in those chat rooms. All right, bye everyone. Thank you, Hai Feng. Thank you, Hi. John. <laughs> and thanks to all those great questions. Wow, they were able to use up, you know, <laughs> almost 40 minutes of discussion time. That's amazing. John, you're still there. Uh, is there anything uh, we need to follow up? Uh, nope, I'm getting ready to shut the, the room down. So thank you very much. And I'm <laughs> recording up in the next week or so. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Bye.